This is our view, the television voice of the Washington Federation of State Employees. Medical patients with limited English skills need an interpreter when dealing with a doctor. The people who provide this service are attempting to organize with the Federation. They see it as an improvement in their lives and the service they provide. Our efforts have helped save the interpreting for limited English uh, proficient patients and we hope to be able to improve, continue to improve the quality of interpreting that's available to people who need our services. And the only way we see that we can do this is through our united efforts through the union, Interpreters United, Washington Federation of State Employees. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act guarantees the right of all people to have access uh, to med medical care when needed and the state was about to actually have eliminated the funds. We fought together throughout the state to reinstate the funds, about eight million dollars, and the state was leaving, would have left itself open to um, lawsuits by people who wouldn't have had access to federally mandated um, interpreting. A recent conference held by the Washington State Labor Council to look into the safety regulations that are supposed to protect workers following incidents that took the lives of workers in Anacortes and the Gulf. It's apparent those rules need more work. We're here today to talk about health and safety and strengthening uh, safety and health laws uh, in our country and in the state. Everyone in this room is an advocate for safety and health, and uh, this country has been rocked over the, the three months of this spring between February and April. There were 52 workers killed in, uh, in four explosions uh, around our country, major disasters at the clean energy uh, plant in Connecticut, obviously the Tesora refinery in Anacortes, Washington, uh, the Massey Upper Big Branch uh, coal mine in West Virginia, and then, of course, the Deepwater Horizon um, rig uh, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico. We had seven of my co-workers, my union brothers and sisters, killed um, that night. All those people were innocent victims. We know that there was nothing they were doing that night that uh, contributed in any direct way to what happened. They were perfect in the procedure they were going through on a related piece of equipment. The industry argues that occupational safety, which essentially cut fingers and sprained ankles and someone falling off a ladder, is uh, all they need to concern themselves with as far as health and safety on the job. We know that we don't die from cut fingers and sprained ankles. We die when the process f fails to be contained. Process safety management is, is uh, where the risk is and it's where our focus needs to be. Um, we've, been, we've been fighting for that focus for years. We're only beginning to make headway, but that's where we need to go on that. From this conference, we will generate interest in pushing Congress to act on the Protecting America's Workers Act, which is a bill that is in Congress right now, in committee, and it has not moved forward because they feel that it's not a priority for working people. And we would like to show the Congress that people are very concerned about workers' health and safety and that we need legislation to make OSHA stronger. Working people face these risks because industry feels that they can they can either hide hazards or, or fail to eliminate hazards. Um, they feel it's cheaper to do that in the long run, probably. They feel that it's cheaper to put our lives at risk and ask us to duck and dodge and try to avoid hazards than it is to remove hazards from the workplace. One of the challenges that we face when we talk about regulation is the uh, difficulty of convincing employers that it makes business sense to pay attention to safety. 
Um, but the reality is that employer after employer has discovered that safety isn't just the right thing to do, although it's certainly that. Safety is a sound investment. Um, it results in fewer injuries and it results in fewer workers' compensation costs as a result of those injuries. But really that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it saves money on training costs, committing to safety improves employee morale, which in turn can improve productivity. Um, the truth is that smart employers have long recognized that an investment in safety, an investment in workplace safety and health is an important part of their overall infrastructure and they would no more set it aside than they would close their payroll operations down. If you think travel on the state's freeways is frustrating, it will be far more frustrating without our Department of Transportation incident response teams. You would have a whole lot more people broke down on the shoulder, which causes uh, people to gawk at uh, disabled vehicles, and which causes, in turn, causes crashes. And if we wasn't there to get those vehicles moved off the shoulder, uh, we would have a whole lot more crashes. And then, of course, that would bottle up traffic, and then it was, you know, basically what we do is save lives. We, we got a call with an accident and we, we was at 54th Ave and we had to work our way through traffic to get there, which somehow can be a, a job in itself just getting to the scene. And once we got there, fire was telling me that they wanted to, uh, uh, they're going to uh, transport one person, which had a medical problem. And uh, what we did was uh, protected the scene until a ambulance took off and then they, they wanted us to stop all traffic where they can move the whole scene to the right shoulder and to open up the freeway. Now, we had a couple of vehicles that were in pretty bad shape, especially the, the motorcycle. Uh, he, its back wheel was locked up, so it, it, that was pretty rough, pushing that thing to the right shoulder. But once we got everything to the right shoulder, and uh, Kathy was able to move my vehicle into the left lane until we went and picked the cones up, and then we, in turn, called State Patrol and told them that all lane was open, and we took off. When we first started this program, cars just sit out there until the tow truck come in and pick them up. So, which causes longer backups and longer headaches for the traveling public. And you know, you got people that's uh, going to business meetings and all kind of stuff and they're on schedule to keep. So what we do basically is get them to their meetings on time and get the road open. And we have people run out of gas, we have people run out of gas, this would, this what gets me, they'll run out of gas in the left lane and they'll sit there and wait for somebody to come up and give them some assistance and they won't even get out and try to, I mean, I know it's dangerous to get out of a car and we tell them to stay in the vehicle, but it'll be kind of hard for me to sit in my vehicle in the left lane, you know, and then I, if my car start sputtering a little bit, I would try to sputter my way to either the right shoulder or the left shoulder. I wouldn't stop right in the lane. And I've had people tell me that uh, he was going to a meeting in Yakima and he wondered could I top his takeoff for him. So make sure they check their gas gauges before they leave home. Make sure they got uh, proper tire inflation so they're not driving on a flat, uh, on a low tire with, you know, not enough air in it. And that would cause blowouts, which in turn, we got to come along in a system to fix it, change their tires. Uh, what we need from drivers is for them to pay attention to the roadway and watch where they're driving, not looking at the incident scene. A lot of times we have the looky-loos going past the scene and that causes traffic to slow down in all lanes. And what we need, need them to do is just pay attention to what's ahead of them and just keep driving and try to keep at a good speed past the scene. We need people to pay attention to our trucks and our cones. We guide people into a, um, a lane that's open for the lane of travel. Um, if we have a, rain, a lane blocked on the freeway, we use our variable message signs on our trucks to guide traffic in the direction we need them to go. They can see those from a long distance and instead of coming right up on our trucks and moving over at the last minute, they can see those from a distance. It help us if they would move over sooner and get into those um, lanes that are open to traffic. Pay attention to the roadway. Don't talk on your cell phones. 
stop texting when going past a scene, and don't be taking pictures of the scene with your phones. Those are things that distract you from your driving and make it unsafe for us out there on the roadway. Labor has a history. Here's Ross Reeder. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was born in 1890 in Concord, New Hampshire. She was born into a radical, activist, working class, intellectual family. Her father was a socialist and her mother a feminist and Irish nationalist. The family moved to the South Bronx 10 years later and Gurley Flynn attended public schools. Gurley Flynn became active in socialist groups and gave her first public speech when she was 15 on women under socialism. She also began making speeches for the industrial workers of the world, the IWW or Wobblies, and was expelled from high school in 1907. She became a full-time organizer for the IWW. Before World War I, Gurley Flynn was involved in organizing strikes, including those of textile workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and Patterson, New Jersey. In 1909, she was involved in the IWW Spokane Free Speech fight. At one point, she chained herself to a power pole, was cut free by the police, and arrested. While in the Spokane jail, she discovered that the police were complicit in arresting prostitutes and encouraging them to ply their trade while in jail. She revealed this to the public which helped move the free speech fight in favor of the IWW. In 1920, Gurley Flynn's concern with basic civil liberties led her to help found the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU. She was elected to the group's national board. She was active in raising support and money for Sacco and Vanzetti, and in trying to free labor organizers Tom Mooney and Warren Billings from San Francisco. Gurley Flynn was forced out of activ activism not by government action, but by ill health. She lived in Portland, Oregon with Dr. Marie Equi, also of the IWW and a supporter of the birth control movement. She remained a member of the ACL ACLU board during these years. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn returned to public life after some years joining the American Communist Party in 1936. She died in 1964. This has been Our View, brought to you by the proud members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. We remind you, when you accept a paycheck for your hard work, you don't give up your rights. Thank you for watching.